So when there's that unresolved trauma, it actually changes the way the DNA is read and transcribed. And so then that can pass the DNA from generation to generation. Why would your mind be anxious? It doesn't do anything unless it's for your benefit. So because you didn't do it, how does your mind protect you? Hello and welcome to Make It Happen with Will Polston. I'm Will Polston, this is episode number 159 and in this episode I'm joined by Dr. Don Wood. Don Wood, PhD, author, speaker, founder and CEO of the Inspired Performance Institute and the creator of the patented TIPP method focuses on helping people resolve their trauma and get their lives to a place of high performance. He has helped thousands of people live a better life and overcome the effects of stress, anxiety, depression, trauma and addiction with his neuroscience-backed program TIPP. TIPP program is designed to clear away the effects of disturbing or traumatic effects, repurpose old thinking patterns and set the individual's mind up for peak performance. Dr. Wood is also an author of two books, Emotional Concussions and You Must Be Out of Your Mind and is releasing his newest book, Don't Mess With My DNA in the Near Future. In this episode, we're going to be talking about overcoming the effects of stress, anxiety, depression, trauma and addiction with the neuroscience-backed program TIPP with Dr. Don Wood. Dr. Don Wood, welcome to the show. Thank you. I've been looking forward to this. You and I both, you and I both. We're going to start this episode off in a way that I've never started an episode off before, which is talking about ice hockey. I love it. (laughs) I was was a little worried, but now I'm no longer worried. (laughs) So for everybody that's been listening, I said, Don, we're going to start this episode talking on a podcast in a way that you probably haven't before. So we're going to go for the jugular. So you are renowned around the world for something we are going to be talking about. But for those that are listening to this for the first time, I spent 23 years playing ice hockey in the UK. I'm a big fan of hockey. And um, so are you. Yeah, well, that was great when we met in Phoenix, right? And we started talking. And, And with your accent, it's not what I would expect to hear. Right. Mm-hmm. I played hockey for that long. So I was excited to, to talk to you about it. So when you're British and you're an ice hockey player and you meet anyone Canadian, I mean, Canadians are literally born with an ice hockey stick and a pair of skates on their feet. And um, the, the obvious thing when you meet anyone from Canada is, oh, do you play hockey? And that's how we got chatting. So because you, you didn't just play hockey, did you? You, you had a pretty, a, a pretty good career as a hockey player. Well, I, I had a chance to play professional hockey in Sweden. So mm-hmm. hockey was a big, big sport for me. Uh, I grew up in Toronto, which is, you know, ice hockey, you know, the the, the basic home of hockey, really. I yeah. mean, it's, there's so much around Toronto, around hockey. So like I said, I started playing when I was very, very little and played all the way up and, you know, as long as I could anyway. So, but I... Uh, Hockey to me was such a great teacher of everything, not just on, you know, obviously sports, but I learned so much from playing hockey and, and so much, so many of my heroes who played hockey back in the, you know, when I was a kid, right. Those were tough guys. (laughs) They were really tough guys. They they played without helmets. I mean, that's Mm. pretty amazing. Mm. And, and, as as well as all of that, and we're going to come on to the Inspired Performance Institute in a moment, but playing hockey, playing it at elite level, going over to Sweden, and, and we shared some stories when we spoke about sort of that, your, your time over there. You also had um, quite a famous next door neighbor growing up. Yes. Don Cherry. Do you know yeah. Don? Yeah, 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 yeah. So for those of you that aren't... Um, uh, aren't familiar with hockey Don, Don Cherry for for the English people in the room Don Cherry was like the Wayne Lineker of ice hockey he was a commentator he was a former player um he played for the Boston Bruins if I remember correctly um he coached the Boston Bruins he also coached them. Colorado um uh-huh. when I met him he had just finished coaching in Colorado and then got the broadcasting job with the uh Canadian Broadcasting so that's when I first met him. He moved in right next door to me. And yeah. believe it or not, I didn't even, at first I didn't know. I saw the Colorado plates, which threw me off. And then um, we went up, my wife and I went over to introduce ourselves and we brought, you know, just introduction to the neighborhood. 
and he's not there, but his wife is there and his son is there wearing a Boston uniform, right? And the dog is called Blue. And if you know anything about Don Cherry, that was his famous dog, a mm. British Bulldog, I guess he was. And so they're saying all these things and all of a sudden it didn't even click onto me. And then I said, what does your husband do? She goes, well, he's now in broadcasting. And I went, what's his name? Don Jerry? She goes, yeah. And I was like, oh my God, well, yeah. I was clueless. Because that, that was where so there's a couple of angles on this. And again, for, for those, I spent my growing up when we would be going away on the bus to away games. We, when we were kids, we would literally watch, I forget the particular, was it hockey night in Canada or whatever it was that yeah. he, he used to broadcast much like, and he used to wear these crazy suits and it, it is a real character. But, but what the question that I was going to ask, and, and obviously I don't know the age that he was or you were when he, um when, when he was living next year, was he, was he an inspiration for you in the sense of like, were you growing up living next door to him or was that when you were a little bit older? No, I was older. So we were oh, married. Right, okay. We actually had, um, I think we had our second child by then. So, you know, it was a little bit older, but he was fascinating to talk to because, you know, he's just like so full of knowledge. I remember one of the things that I talked to him about was, you know, Wayne Gretzky, who's the greatest hockey player of all time. I said to him, as I said, I, I disagree with this, but tell me your opinion. I said, a lot of people say that Wayne Gretzky gets special protection. You know, that anybody hits them, it's a guaranteed penalty, even if it's a clean hit. And he's going, that's nonsense. They can't hit him. Mm -hmm. They try to hit him. And his lateral movement is so good, right, that they just can't put a finger on him. So they can glance him. Right. But what they learn to do, and this is where Gretzky, you know, we're maybe getting way, this could be a whole hockey broadcast. <laughs> but why did Gretzky become the greatest assist, you know, uh, score in the league was because they wouldn't let him get in front of the net. Mm. So the strategy in the NHL was to corral him so he couldn't get direct access to the goal. So they pushed him behind the net. So mm. then he, they, that became what he called his office. Gretzky's office. Yeah, Gretzky's office. That was what we were taught. Where, anywhere behind the net, if you're a forward, you're in Gretzky's office. Yeah. And the idea was, is that if you went to go get him, he's so quick, right, that you wouldn't, you'd look stupid. So what you had to do is just defend and let him set up in his office. And he would just wait for the right guy to come in at the right time and make the pass at the right time. That's how, and if you took away all of Gretzky's goals, just left him as assists, he's still the leading goal scorer in the NHL. Wow, incredible. There's never been an athlete ever in, in any sport to dominate as much as he did. Incredible. I suppose, I suppose it's a little bit like um, Ovi now, isn't it? You know, if you're watching a power play and you see Ovi up there on the blue line at the top of the curling circles, that that's a dangerous place for 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 him to be sort of un, unmarked. Anyway, I don't want to turn this into a hoggy podcast. I want I us to, no, to, to I, we, we could have a wonderful conversation. But now, what is really interesting though is, like you say, even, even from from back then, you you were looking to glean the wisdom of other people. You know, he was a great Don Cherry was a a famous, still is a very famous name in in the world of hockey. He must be ninety something years old now, and mm -hmm. um and and you were obviously looking to glean those lessons and those wisdom um, from people. So what I want to know is. Let, let's kind of go back and let, let's because obviously you've gone from professional hockey player over in Sweden doing your thing growing up in Toronto like you say there's literally the the, the hall of hockey the, the hockey hall of fame that's there and everything else Toronto Maple Leafs one of the most famous teams I believe they're one of the original five original six um original six, yeah. original six. um so at what point do you make that transition of, right, I'm going to go into the the world of helping people. And I know the Inspired Performance Institute actually has a mission, making the impossible possible. So I, I would refer to that as kind of a North Star, but how did that start? It really was totally unusual. I was not involved in this at all. Um, I had to sort of get involved to save my daughter's life. Mm. Is I was actually almost in my 50s before I even started doing this. And my daughter was diagnosed with Crohn's at 14. And they said, there's no cure for Crohn's. We don't know what causes Crohn's. It's an autoimmune disorder. And they said, she's just going to have to manage it for the rest of her life. And so she ended up having four resections done. They cut out about 24 inches of her intestines. I mean, she really struggled with it and was constantly getting infections and sick. 
and yet she's still high functioning. She's an actress and she's living out in LA and doing all kinds of Lost, ER, CSI, a lot of great shows, but always going down with getting sick. And then she was diagnosed with a second lung disorder, another autoimmune called idiopathic pulmonary hemosiderosis. And that's basically autoimmune where the iron in the blood starts to get released. And so she could choke to death on her blood. So that's when my wife said to me, because my, my background is I'm from Canada. I was adopted and I was adopted by these amazing human beings that were just so nurturing and loving that um, I grew up in that kind of an environment. So I've been healthy my entire life. Um, I, as you know, played hockey, 60 stitches in my head, six concussions. I never missed a hockey game. Will never. Mm. I, now, again, we played right through a lot of injuries back then, but still I healed so quickly. But I believe that came from the nurturing home I was growing up in. I felt safe. So my nervous system was regulated. My immune system stayed regulated. And I've lived now in Florida for over 30 years and I've never seen a doctor. So wow. When she got those diagnoses, my wife said to me, this must be your fault because this must be coming from your genetic side of the family. And we don't know anything about your genetics. So you need to figure this out. So I went back to school and got my PhD and uh, decided to learn all about this. And what I discovered really saved her life. Wow. So what did you discover? That, well, a lot of people that I started meeting when I was doing my research had trauma mm. and in particular, sexual abuse is a big trauma. And so I started making this connection with all these people with all these autoimmune disorders, all having trauma. So I said, this must be the, the root cause of most of the you know autoimmune disorders. And what I discovered and through all the research is that when they have, when we have unresolved trauma, and what I mean by that is it's never really been resolved. So it's still running in the background. So if it's running in the background, unresolved trauma creates inflammation. Mm. Inflammation is the response to trauma. So we know from playing hockey, if you get, whether it's a physical or an emotional injury, if you get hit in the arm, right? Your arm's going to swell up. The inflammation is designed to protect the system. It's, inflammation is not a bad thing. It's chronic inflammation that's not good. But the inflammation temporarily is meant to protect the system. So the cells go into a cell danger response to protect them. So nothing can penetrate the cell while it's under attack. When the the, the trauma is over, you stop hitting me in the arm, My the swelling is going to go down, the immune system will come in and clean up. It's exactly the way it's designed. The problem is, is that trauma continues to run. It's the way we store memory about trauma. Mm. So it's perpetual. So it's, to lack of a better way to explain it is, if you're attacked by a lion, if an animal gets attacked by a lion, they don't store the memory of that. They know that a lion is dangerous, but they didn't store all the information about that attack. That's why, you know, you heard the old saying, shake it off. Mm. What happens when an animal gets attacked? They'll eventually then get up and shake and they're resetting their nervous system. And so we call, we use that in sports all the time. I don't know if you use that, but it was like, go on, get up, shake it off. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. That was the idea is to shake it off. Now what animals are doing is basically resetting the nervous system. The problem for humans is that we store tremendous amounts of details about those events. So it's perpetual lion. So it's a nonstop lion attacking us. So that's why the inflammation for my daughter never went down. So the inflammation chronic. Is cro became chronic yeah. because it's yeah. running. So what I did is developed a, a, a program that can reset the nervous system by resetting the memory. And so I can take that high definition traumatic memory and reset it so it stops activating the nervous system. And then the inflammation comes down. It's really that simple. So I was having a conversation with a friend of mine literally two hours ago before we jumped on this call, and we were talking about 
trauma and again you've got capital t trauma and lowercase t trauma um in in the sense of of, of how a lot of people think of trauma and what i mean by that is sort of capital t trauma for a lot of people is like sexual abuse they've been attacked physically attacked lowercase trauma is a perception of something happening which could have been, happened as a kid which most of us as adults would look look at it and go well that's not that bad but in that moment for that child it felt like a hugely threatening I experience and we were talking about um trauma and these experiences being passed down from generation to generation because it's held at a cellular level do you agree with that Yes, it's actually held in terms of a genetic expression. Yeah. It's how the genes express. So when there's that unresolved trauma, it actually changes the way the DNA is read and transcribed. Mm. And so then that can pass the DNA from generation to generation. So if it doesn't get activated, though, it may not show up, but it is predisposed. That's what they call being predisposed to it. Mm. So um, for my daughter... She obviously, my wife had trauma as a child. I didn't have trauma, but anyway, her genetic markers are set by her mom's activation, right? And then they start showing up. So, cause I'm thinking, geez, I've never had any of these health issues. Why have I never had these health issues? And yet she's suffering. Mm -hmm. And it was coming from that change in the way it's certain um, genet genes. And this is what we're working on as a study. There's certain genes that actually are affected, neuroplasticity genes, immune system genes, um, the uh, neurotransmitter genes, uh, inflammation genes. So when there's trauma, the genes that actually affect the inflammation actually upregulate, they go higher. So when they go higher, the immune system genes go lower. And mm -hmm. same with neuroplasticity and neurotransmitters. So what's going to happen is if your inflammation genes go up, you're going to become inflamed, right? And then the neurotransmitters and neuroplasticity, all of that starts to also change. What I now am looking at and doing the study on is that when we resolve the trauma, it resets. Mm -hmm. So you can actually, the good news about this whole thing is it's not permanent. And this is what I'm talking about is we're designed to heal, right? We know that from playing hockey. I mean, you can get banged up pretty good, but you know, you two days later, you're back out on the ice and playing, right? I yeah, I I, I mean, I I had I got a cut from my head from the crown of my head that was a probably about six inches long, got stitched up. I was on morphine in the hospital on the Friday, and then I was playing hockey on the Saturday. So yeah, I. Uh... But hockey players are different. I mean, it's really. I don't know if you ever studied it. I mean, we're right back to hockey now again, but there was a book written by Ken Dryden, the famous Montreal Canadian mm -hmm. goalie who talked about the history of hockey. Mm -hmm. It started from the origins of hockey. And I forget whether it was 11 players that each team had. So every team had 11 players and they all played at the same time. So you were all on the ice. Mm -hmm. So if you got injured and had to go to the bench, your team played with one less player. Right. So a mentality developed in hockey from the very beginning is that it, even if you're just a body on the ice, right, you're getting in somebody's way, you're better off there than being on the bench. Yeah. So don't let your team down, play through everything. Yeah. And that mentality developed in hockey. They, that saying there, I've literally been told by coaches, don't let your team down, play through everything. I've literally been told that. Um, so th this is this is re really, really interesting. So so obviously your your daughter had this experience. You went off and studied it. You found it. And the other thing I wanted to say, because I think this is helpful, hopefully for people, is that, um, and I'm going to share this because of, I'm, I'm a big believer that have conviction in what you believe, but be flexible enough to have your opinions changed. Because I believe for a long, long time that there's no such thing as ancestral trauma. Nothing gets passed on. It's ridiculous. Then one day somebody was explaining to me, well, you could look at somebody's child and you can evidently see that they've got the eyes of their mom, the nose of the dad, the ears of the dad, whatever, maybe the the, the, the head shape or the body shape of the uncle or whatever it might be, right? You can see that, that they, they, they are a... Uh, a, a, like you can just see that they're, they're um, a product of their parents, let's say. 
Sure. And they said, well, if if that can happen with their body parts, what do you think happens with their beliefs and their memories? And that was the penny drop moment for me. Like you're saying that at a genetic level that this is stored and then obviously can be passed on, which when that when I when it was phrased to me like that, I thought, you know what? Yeah, of course, it's obvious that these things can be changed. And what most of us don't know, I mean, the majority of people certainly consciously can't remember from probably the ages of at least two, like on, like before two. Or there or thereabouts, you know. So, so therefore, you think, well, how could I ever possibly remember about any trauma or stresses, anxiety, or anything else that parents or grandparents have had? But this is what your process your process enables people to be able to go back and 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 change, which we're going to go into in a moment. I believe I'm right in saying that's exactly it. So the the best way for me to explain it is only humans do this. We store details about events and experiences. So, Will, if I asked you what you ate for dinner last night, can you tell me what you ate for dinner? I can. What'd you have? I had um, chicken and rice and veg. So when people are watching this recording, they're going to notice that you looked up and you saw mm -hmm. pictures, right, of what you ate. Mm -hmm. Probably saw the food, the, where you were when you ate it. That's how you stored the information about dinner last night. Now, last night wasn't threatening or disturbing, so it's stored as a fairly low-resolution file. But if that was a traumatic event, all your senses are heightened, sight, smell, hearing. So how's it going to record it? Mm. I bet. Tremendous amounts of detail gets stored in that memory. So now what happens is five years from now, you get into another situation that looks like, sounds like, smells like that event. And your mind uses resources to know how to respond. So it goes back into memory to say, what do we know about this smell or this sound or whatever? It starts to look at the old data and starts responding to it in real time. Mm -hmm. Because it think your subconscious, your survival brain is always present in the moment. It sees everything as now. Even memory is seen as now. So it's going to activate your nervous system. It has to. So when people say, oh, they come in and they say, you know, I'm just a very anxious person. I go, why? Your mind doesn't get anxious for no reason. There's a reason why it's getting anxious. Probably it's a glitch. It's an error message. It's reading old data. And so what if we could take that old high definition data and reprocess it into the same format as to what you ate for dinner last night? Mm then it stops activating the nervous system and you don't have the emotion. Mm. And that's what I do. And that's possible to change. So for anybody, but if you've had, you know, genetic trauma that has been passed on, it may not get activated unless there's an activation. Mm. You could be carrying the genetic predisposition to it because there's a memory of it. But as long as your mind, right, is not being, ex so that was a perfect example of me, right? Apparently, because I was adopted, I didn't know anything about my family history up until about two and a half years ago. And I couldn't have created this experiment. It was perfect. I had six siblings. All six siblings lived in two separate houses, three before I was born, three after I was born. All of them were in traumatic households, abusive, alcoholic, addicted houses. Two on the first three died of cancer. The third one has a heart condition. Two of the last three died. All of them had addiction issues. Mm -hmm. And I've never touched a drink in my life, never touched a drug in my life. Right? Why? Because mm -hmm. I had a completely different environment. And I've been healthy in my entire life. There's a, a, a mutual friend of ours, Joe Polish, mm -hmm. and pretty much every time I've been in the presence of Joe, so actually in a physical environment, there's a particular quote of yours he uses. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, absolutely. And what I say is if you understood the atmospheric conditions of a person's life, you would understand why they behave they, the way they behave and why they do what they do. Yeah. And that's really what it is. So my wife grew up in very traumatic household with a very angry father. So she lived in fear. I could never figure out why she was always afraid. She's with me. I've never yelled at her. I've never hit her. And yet she's still living in fear with me. Why is she living in fear? Because she knows I'm never going to touch her or hurt her or even yell at her. 
but she would still respond with fear because that was the atmospheric condition she grew up in is you'd never let your guard down, right? You never be safe. You never feel comfortable because you're going to get hurt. Mm -hmm. So she was just waiting for something to happen, even though logically she knew nothing was going to happen. And interestingly enough, I had a guy, I was on a, another podcast and this guy called in when I described my wife, this guy plays in the NHL. And he said to me, he goes, you're describing my wife. Uh -huh. He goes, we're millionaires. We fly in private jets. We've got everything we could possibly ever want in our life. And yet she doesn't look like she's truly enjoying it mm -hmm. because her mind would not let her enjoy it because you're going to get hurt if you get too excited. So stay low. And that was the way her mind, those were her atmospheric conditions. He totally got it, said, now I get it. I kept thinking, what am I not doing right? Why am? Why is my wife not enjoying this amazing life we have? And yet that's where it was coming from. But it's coming from her conditioning of knowing how things were in the past. And that's the association that she's created. Is that right? So that's the world that she has been learning yeah. how to stay safe. So that's conditioned. Those are her atmospheric conditions. And then that's going to dictate how she's going to operate currently, unless those get cleared up. Yeah. Okay. Amazing. The method that you use, TPP, mm -hmm. what does it stand for? It's the Inspired Performance Program. Yeah. So the idea is, is we focus on performance. So trauma just interferes with your ability to perform at your highest level. And that's what I always talk about. Everybody has another gear. And that's why I love working with athletes because even the top performing athletes in the world can have another gear and they can step up again. So when we have unresolved trauma, this is on the physical side, it actually affects the mitochondria, the energy in the cells. You have millions of mitochondria in every cell. That's the power that you need, right, to operate. So the mitochondria are producing ATP, which is the energy to move. So when we have this trauma, it actually affects the way the mitochondria operate. So you have less power. So when you resolve the trauma, all of a sudden performance goes up. One of my favorite quote, well, no, it's not even a quote. One of my favorite formulas is your potential is equal to your performance minus interference. And that's essentially what you're saying, right? Is that that interference is the, um, is, is, is what's getting in the way. Yeah. And, and that's how I first met Joe. I was speaking at the Spartan world championships and Joe was speaking and I was speaking. I went to hear him speak. Somebody told me, oh, you got to go listen to Joe. He's amazing. And so I ended up striking up a conversation and then we ended up going to dinner. And then he said, I heard that you're working with one of the athletes here. And I said, yeah, his name's Rob Killian. And Rob's Special Forces Green Beret. He's running the World Championships on Sunday. And so anyway, the lady who asked me to work with him, she ran Spartan Japan. And she said, there's three guys that are dominating all the races. She says, I just want to see how much Rob can improve against them. That's sort of the base. How much can he cut down on their time against his time? And so I worked with Rob on Friday through this program. He ran in the world championships on Sunday and won the whole thing. Wow. And what I said to Rob, I said, Rob, I didn't make you faster. You were always that fast. I said, you just didn't have the access to the power because it was running the loop, the trauma loop. And I worked with another group uh, in like Nona, Florida, who work with world-class athletes from all over the world. They do amazing training and they measure them constantly. So when I talked about the mitochondria and how that affects performance, the one guy, he's a neuroscientist, he stopped me and he goes, hold on, you just blew my mind. He says, we never, so they measure heart rate variability. They do a whole bunch of different types of measurements. He says, we never understood why these world-class athletes would go into a sympathetic nervous system response when they were at rest. Mm -hmm. He says, that made no sense. They weren't stressed out at all, yet they're still responding as a, with a stress response. You're telling me it's the trauma loop that's running in the background? I said, yep. He said, we never knew that. Mm -hmm. So imagine when you take that energy drain away from a world-class athlete 
you know, and you give him that 1% edge over his competition. That's the difference. Yeah. Amazing. And, and the, some of the symptoms that people will be experiencing in order for the, the, the TPP method for, to, to work for them, they'll be feeling stressed. They're anxious, um, trauma, anxiety, you know, what, what, what are some of the other things that people will be experiencing to know that this methodology can help them no longer have those, those, those feelings and gain access to all of their potential. So one of the things that I talk about, we talked about the small T traumas, I call them emotional concussions. Mm. So they may not be because a lot of people come in and go, well, you know, I saw you work with Boston Marathon bombing survivors and the people from the Vegas shooting these huge traumas. And I don't have anything like that. And I said, but those emotional concussions can add up just like physical concussions can add up. And I said, so we need to get to those because it's all relative. You know, mm. if you had a teacher that was constantly criticizing you when you were growing up or a parent that was constantly critical, you'll say, well, I wasn't abused, right? But that constant criticism wears you down, right? And then, well, you'll develop a meaning from it. I'm just not smart enough, right? I mean, that's what happened to my wife. I mean, her father was the smartest guy in the world, in the, in the room, and he wasn't. But he had to make sure that they knew he was so that they so he would put them down, the, his siblings or his children down all the time so that he looked smarter. And so my wife never felt smart and she's brilliant. Mm. So that kind of stuff, those are emotional concussions as well as she had other stuff, but those add up. You wrote a book called Emotional Concussions, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just for that purpose, because so many people will say, well, I haven't had anything really big happen to me. And then, and then they start talking about stuff and I go, well, yeah, that's, that's trauma, right? Mm -hmm. It's an emotional concussion, but it is trauma. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on, on the topic of books, um, you must be out of your mind. It's the first book, right? Which is the whole program and how I, the story behind it and how I developed it. And more recently, don't mess with my DNA. That's the most recent one, which is we're doing the studies now, because I'm actually going to prove that we can change the system back and improve not only emotional health, but physical health as well. And so we can reset it. Our minds and bodies are designed to heal. They're brilliant devices, right? We just sometimes get stuck in our own way and think that we need to chemically alter our, our brains to, to heal. We don't. Our brain can heal. The reason it's not healing is it's stuck, Mm. Right? so what do we do when our computer gets stuck or our phone gets stuck we turn it off and reset it that's exactly what i do with the program and i can do it fast and we don't need and i don't even need to know well i don't need to know what the trauma is in order to help you because that was going to be my next question so there's a lot of people listening saying, oh that's interesting and yeah i can see maybe how there were some things and some patterns running and particularly if it's ancestral stuff that's going on but they're they're, they're finding so i know that there's a particular situation that happens and it's interesting you talk about well my interpretation is it's you create the association so in like, i'm schooled in nlp so i'll use a lot of nlp language so we'll create an anchor effectively sort of an unconscious anchor to being in a particular state when a particular event happens and that's just kind of what the the body's reacting and until you choose to sort of undo that um a lot of the times that people just aren't aware that that's even even happening um you you mentioned a couple, but what what would you say for for the, the well? I suppose let's let's look at a couple of options. What's an example of another sort of quite out there extreme version of this working? You mentioned one of the guy that then won on, and won the whole championship, and then what's an example of like for an, the everyday person that isn't necessarily a top athlete, the how they then benefit from having experienced this process. Well, the best way for me to explain it is, and this is what I tell people, if you have an emotion when you think about an event that happened to you, say, 20 years ago, that tells me the trauma is active. Because the purpose of an emotion is a call for an action. The purpose of fear is to escape a threat. The purpose of anger is to attack a threat. So if you think about something that happened five years ago and your heart's pounding in your chest, what does that tell you? Your nervous system just got activated to get you to run five years ago. It's a glitch. And so I can when I explain that to people, it was like, well, that makes so much sense. So I said, the reason it's activating is because it's such high definition. 
that the mind, you know, Hollywood's made trillions of dollars from this. They can convince us in a movie theater that what's playing on that screen is real, right? And you know from NLP, right? So you can't tell the difference between real or imagined. Your subconscious is always present. So that movie looks real to your subconscious, not to your logical mind, but to your subconscious mind. That's what memory's doing. So memory's doing the same thing. So if people come in with post-traumatic stress, anxiety, depression, whatever it is, I have a very different approach. I say, all of those are symptoms. They're not the problem. Mm. But if you go in and say, I have anxiety, they're going to treat the symptom and put you on anti-anxiety meds. So what I say is, why would your mind be anxious? It doesn't do anything unless it's for your benefit. Mm. Because I am, when people say, well, I sabotage myself. I say, it's impossible. The brain is a survival brain. It can't sabotage. It's trying to protect you. So where's the glitch or error message? It's reading some information. We just need to reset it. So mm. it stops reading it in real time. Yeah, I'm I'm a, a huge believer that in any negative emotion, and arguably positive emotion, is simply a signal. That's what it is. It's a signal to think or act differently. And, um, and, and obviously in this instance, it's thinking differently, but most people aren't necessarily able to do it consciously. Hence they use your process that they, they go through to be able to, uh, essentially reset and, um, and, and reset the memory in, in that instance. So an interesting way, and this one of the things that I say, and I talked to Joe about this too, is I said, for example, depression, depression is a function of the brain, not a dysfunction. Mm. People go, well, how is it a function? And I say, if your mind has been trying to get you into an action for a long time, it's been angry about something. Usually when people say, they come and say, I'm depressed, I'll say, tell me what you're angry about. And they'll say, well, I'm really depressed. And I say, well, depression is generally anger. So what has your mind been trying to get you to do for the last 10 years, five years, whatever it is, and you didn't do it? And why didn't you do it? Because you can't do it. You can't stop that person from hurting you five years ago but your mind keeps calling you for the action. So I'll give you an example. A guy, a US Army sniper who had to shoot and kill a 12 year old boy. So when I saw him, he for eight years, he'd just been medicated at the VA. And he said, I can't talk about this anymore. And I said, well, good, I don't need you to talk about it. We're gonna fix it. By the time I was finished, he could give me a complete description of that event that day mm. without shaking and crying. He goes, how did you do that? And I said, I didn't do anything. I said, for eight years, your mind has been trying to get you not to pull the trigger. That would solve the problem. But you can't not pull the trigger. But your mind didn't know that. So it kept trying to get you angry to stop it. It was trying to create an action that was impossible for you to do. Mm -hmm. So because you didn't do it, how does your mind protect you? It shuts down. Depression is the absence of emotions. The emotions have not worked to get the action. That's a totally different way of looking at it, as opposed to there's something wrong with you. Yeah, very interesting indeed. So let, let's talk about some mind hacks. So a lot of people listen to this. I'm a huge advocate for mindset and, and using your your mind and, and various different tools and techniques to enable you to, to do things differently. So what are some um, sort of mind hacks to maybe focus the mind or get better sleep or reboot essentially the the people that are listening to this now we could share with them that would be helpful well especially sleep is a big one because a lot of people have trouble sleeping but the issue is is understanding how brain waves work so the reason why they're having trouble to sleep is because they're in a high beta brain wave state so the mind in beta your mind is operating at about, or your brain is operating functionally at about 15 to 30 hertz or cycles per second. So it's pretty active. So in order to go to sleep, you have to go from beta through alpha into theta and then into delta. But the problem is if people are lying in bed and they're thinking, they're staying in a beta brainwave state and then trying to force the sleep. And so the mind isn't going to go to sleep if it's still got work to do. So as long as it's active, it's going to be trying to do that. Where you want to gradually go to sleep. Don't try to go to sleep instantly. Train your brain to learn how to go to sleep. So go from beta 
listen to meditation, do whatever you can do. There's all kinds of different techniques that you can use, but you have to go into alpha and then move into theta. So alpha is between seven and 14 hertz or cycles per second. The mind's super relaxed and focused. So now what you want to do in alpha is focus on one thing. So one of the things that I do, I'm a golfer. I don't know if you're a golfer, but I, I golf. So I'll replay the round of golf I played that day. And I'll just, so I'll just be focused on, and I almost never finish 18 holes. I'm usually gone because now I'm super focused and super relaxed. And then I just ease into theta. And before you know it, I've fallen asleep. But you just can't jump from beta to theta. It's too big a leap. And that's why people struggle with sleeping. So that's always a good one. And I also say, don't think about sleep. Think about rest. Mm. So when you go to bed and you lie down, that's that really good feeling that you go, oh, that feels so good, right? Just focus on that. And focus on the, the rest and what it feels like to rest. Don't start saying, I got to sleep, I got to sleep. Because the more pressure you put on, then your mind starts racing again. So enjoy the rest, each process. So I find that that works really well for me. So you can even do little things, even if it's just tactile, you know, uh, rubbing the, uh, the, the bedspread or whatever it is, right? In between your fingers, just feel that. So what you're doing is now you're focusing on one thing and your mind's not running anymore. So you can feel the softness of the sheets or feel the comforter or whatever it is, or the pillow right? Those are the kinds of things. Let your mind wind down. Mm. You're saying about focus and, and focusing to be able to sleep. There's a lot of people that will be listening to this that will be entrepreneurs, that are high achievers, that their mind's running at 100 miles an hour when they're, when they're awake, let alone trying to go to sleep. Um, what What's some tips for people that want to focus their attention? Well, first of all, don't sit and watch TV and then and then go to bed. Right. So you have to do some things to slowly wind down. Reading is much better than watching TV. So you can read if you want to, or just sort of sit in a quiet room, start turning off lights. Don't have a lot of stimulation. Sorry, I meant I meant in the day. So not not necessarily to go oh, to sleep, but in, in the day. Yeah. So if you're you're an entrepreneur, your mind's running a hundred miles an hour, but you know you need to focus and double down on the thing that the task at hand. What's some tips to, to be able to focus the mind? It's really, you have to practice it. It's mind, it's training, it's brain training. If you've never done it and all of a sudden you say, okay, I'm going to do this now, you're not going to be very good at it. It's like if you say, I'm going to be a golfer today, right? You go out and play golf, you're not going to be very good. You have to practice it. So I say, think of repetition as research for the brain. Mm. The more you repeat it, the more the mind feels safe with it. And so it'll learn to gradually come there because your mind always wants to protect you and, and do the right thing. But it's been believing that you need to be high energy in order to survive. Mm. And so you've trained it that way. It's the same thing with ADHD. When people say ADHD, I say, well, I'll guarantee you that that child grew up in a stressful home. They mm. train their brain not to focus in order to stay away from the stress. So now during the most formative brain development years between zero and seven, this child has trained their brain to not listen. They literally do this. And then you stick them in a school and say, now you have to focus. Well, they train their brain to do the opposite. And then we immediately say there's something wrong with the child. You need to put them on Adderall or Ritalin or whatever speed, right? To, to speed them up. No, they just need to be retrained. And then you know about the brain as well, right? The brain trains. You just have to train it. And it's not going to train the first day you do it. It's going to get better and better and better. But the biggest problem is people want an instant fix. And so when it comes to that kind of thing, you just have to become very focused and disciplined. And entrepreneurs are good at that. If they're a good entrepreneur, they know how to be disciplined. So this is just becoming disciplined another way. Mm. that's generally and that's what i do in the program as well we give them tools to do that and then we also give them audios to listen to that helps them start to train and go into that alpha brainwave state amazing 
So if people are listening to this and they're like, do you know what? I'm intrigued. I want to find out more about the Inspired Performance Program, find out more about the Inspired Performance Institute, find out more about you. Where can they do that? How can they do that, Dom? So our, our website is probably the best place to go. It's the Inspired Performance Institute. And if you notice, there's nothing in there about trauma. It's all focused on performance. And trauma is just interfering with your best performance, whether that's relationships or business or sports. So inspiredperformanceinstitute.com, you can uh, have a call with one of the um, advisors that can take you through the whole program, how it works, all the different options that you can do. We have an online version of it. So if you can't get into Orlando or you can't get to an event where I'm at, right, you can do the whole four hours online. And uh, it's another, and people get great success with that. Amazing. Very good. Well, Don, thank you so much for joining me on the show. It's been great to have you and uh, I look forward to having you back in the not too distant future and we can talk more things, Inspired Performance Institute and, and program and hockey and everything else. That sounds great. I look forward to it. I look forward to definitely seeing you in Phoenix again too, I'm sure. It, it won't be long for sure. Um, so everyone has been listening to this, go and head to the website, find out more if you're interested. We'll put a link to the website in the show notes so you can head straight to that and go and check that out. And once again, Dom, thank you so much for joining me. It's been great to have you on the show. I appreciate it, Will. Thanks so much. And for everyone that's been listening, until next time, make it happen. Thank you for listening to Make It Happen with Will Polston. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Please feel free to share it with anybody that you think could benefit from it. And also make sure that you hit subscribe so that you get to get the new episodes as soon as they're released.